a mighty move of the Spirit is going to break loose in the Northeast. And I spoke this, the earlier service, thousands of New Yorkers are coming to this house. Thousands. So we've got to get this building up. We need to do it quick. And uh, I've got other things I want to share with you, but a couple of quickies here. One is the Passion Translation. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, I did have a commissioning from the Lord to initiate this project of a new dynamic equivalent translation of the Word of God. I know there's many good Bible translations, and you're not going to go wrong with those. But the Lord has sovereignly chosen me to put this translation forward. And uh, I've been involved four, to uh, four years now doing this. We have Psalms, Proverbs. By the way, Walmart got a hold of me. You ever heard of them? They contacted me and said, we want to put uh, Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, we have it separate right now, but they're going to do a Walmart edition. And Psalms and Proverbs are going to be put together uh, in one edition and, and uh, sold in, uh, I don't know how many thousands of Walmart and Sam's Clubs there are. But I'm... I'm going from Costco and Target now. I'm going to Walmart. Uh, they, they've got my attention. Uh, Anderson Merchandisers, which are the, the merchandising buying agency for Walmart, they're the ones that uh, apparently someone at the top, I don't know if it was a Walton family member. Uh, there are some believers in the Walton family, but uh, someone at the top got a hold of this book, and it so wrecked their lives, they called the uh, Anderson Merchandisers and said, get it in every Walmart. So by August, September of this year, and time for Christmas, uh, you'll be able to uh, get it. Uh, why wait till then? Go ahead and go to the back table. Not right now, but uh, at the end of the meeting, go on the way back, on the way out, and if there's any left, uh, I don't think we have much left on the table, but whatever's left, uh, uh, thou shalt get the Passion Translation. And I'm going to read a little bit more from it in just a moment. The second thing I want to mention is the Israel trip. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, thou shalt go to Israel with me. Uh, che, On, and I will be leading this Israel revival tour along with Pastor Glenn and a bunch of you. I hope you'll, you'll not let unbelief, fear, doubt keep you back. You've said it all your life. I want to go to Israel. Some of you have already been. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You want to get back. Uh, every year we do these teams, these tours. So uh, it will be more than just visiting sites. We're going to minister to some Arab believers this is really amazing. In Nazareth, you know, that's where Jesus was raised. It's really amazing. We're going to go right into Nazareth and have a meeting uh, bigger than this with uh, Arab Palestinian Christians. And they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see miracles and healings break loose like we did last year. It's just phenomenal. So for nothing other than that, come as a ministry team and uh, lay hands on and pray over a number of Arabs that are believing in uh, Jesus Christ. Isa. And uh, we'll also have communion at the empty tomb. You're going to dance with me on the Sea of Galilee on a sailboat in the middle of the sea. Uh, you'll get some ahava. You ladies will get the ahava facial stuff uh, made from the Dead Sea salts. And um, you'll get to float in the Dead Sea. Listen, just come. Thou shalt come. Don't put it off to next year. Thou knowest not what a year bringest forth. So thou shouldest come this year to Israel. And we're just going to have a blast. I mean, it's the one surprise for me is how much we love the team and we fall in love with each other and we just have a just hilarious time. We stay in some pretty nice hotels and eat unbelievable food, hummus, pita, oh, grape leaves, the whole, the whole deal. Lamb, you're going to enjoy it. So tell the person next to you, maybe you should go. All right. Okay, really good to be back. Father, in Jesus' name, open the deepest place in our heart and put truth, embed truth into our inner being. Let every defense mechanism get, get, uh, get broken inside of us and leap over every wall that we would put in front of you and come to your beloved, come to each one of us today in a very unusual way and whisper in our ear the truth that will set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share a message of hope today. I want to crash your pity party. I want to ruin your depression. And I want you, uh, actually we've asked the ushers to lock the doors and nobody leaves until you get some hope inside of you. 
Uh, you've been the cover page for the Book of Lamentations long enough. <laughs> you have, uh, you have uh, spoken things about your life, your family, and you've spoken hopeless words over situations. That's going to change after today. Such as I have, give I unto you. And I have hope burning in my heart. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm hopeless without Jesus Christ. I have nothing apart from him. And my wife said, amen. There is nothing in me or in you that commends us to God, that, that qualifies us in any way apart from grace. Uh, the Holy Spirit one time told me, Brian, he said, Brian, you are fully qualified to be humble. <laughs> Every one of us have a need for grace and hope to fill our heart. And the Bible gives us the God of hope, the hope-filled truth of Scripture. You know, uh, our hope is, is not uh, flimsy. It's not built on the economic situation. It's not on whether our guy is in the White House or not. It, it is not political, economic. Our hope is not even that we're going to hit 50 degrees today, which would really be nice. By the way, is this the first weekend in this year that it hasn't snowed? I mean, it's crazy up here. Our hope is, is actually an anchor. Our hope is an anchor that doesn't go down. It goes up. Yes. Hebrews 6.19, do you have a Bible? Thou shalt turn to Hebrews 6.19. Hebrews 6.19. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Hebrews. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And this hope has entered the inter inner sanctuary behind the veil where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of, of Melchizedek. We have hope because our hope has entered into the Holy of Holies and as an anchor holds us fast. I like that. I am held fast and secure by an anchor that keeps me from drifting, keeps me from wandering, keeps me from getting into silliness or into darkness. And you have that hope anchor as well. The Bible has so much to say about hope. Peter, you know, Peter, the guy that kind of blew it, he, he really messed up. You know, I, when I think of Peter, I, I think of Rocky, Rocky Balboa, you know. Uh, his name was Rock, by the way, Peter the Rock. And I think a Rocky kind of comes to my mind. And uh, it is just, he's always going to be there and kind of fight his way through everything, you know. And even when Jesus said that his disciples were going to run away, Jesus said, I'll never, uh, Peter said to him, I'll never leave you. I'm never going to betray you. And what did Jesus have to tell him? He had to pop his bubble. What did he tell Rocky? He said, Rocky, you're cocky. And just to show you that, I'm going to give the sign of a rooster crowing. Because you're the crowing rooster. And before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny you even know me. And you talk about the blankety blank words. Peter used actually one of those words. When he was approached by a, a, a girl, and the scriptures indicate the Greek word there is she was possibly a preteen girl. Just a young girl. And, and, and he couldn't even admit to her that he knew Jesus. But Peter gives us in his first letter, chapter 1, he speaks about a living hope. That we have a living hope. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. A hope that will never fade. It's reserved in heaven. It's forever strong and faithful. What is it that you're disturbed about today? Is it the jerk you work, you, uh, I mean, the person you work with? Is it a boss? Is it your spouse? If it is, don't look at them right now, if they're in the room. Is it a wayward child? What is it? Is it finances? Is it a health matter? What would drain you of hope? Oh, but Pastor Brian, the, the world, America's going to H-E-L-L, -L and, and everything's going to be horrible. We've got to hide and hoard. 
We got to go plant gardens. I'm too busy to go plant a garden. I'm sorry. You can plant your garden, and if something happens, you think it's going to happen, I'll come over and eat your, your asparagus. But I'm not hoarding seeds, planting gardens, stacking guns in a back room. This is the time of the hope of the gospel to go to the nations. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. You were born for such a time as this. Dear Esther, mighty John the Baptist, you are here for such an hour as this. We're going to change the world. We're going to change this planet. And it's going to be by the hope of the gospel. You know how many hopeless people are walking the streets of Greenwich and, and of course, New York and, and throughout Connecticut? We're the ones that shine with hope. I loved being a missionary, going to the tribes, going to indigenous people. My wife and I so thoroughly enjoyed our career as missionaries. And, and it was like our dream come true. We got married, and on our wedding cake, we had go into all the world and preach the gospel. And lo, I am with you always. So we always told our pilot that flew us into the jungle, you know, keep it low, because lo, I'm with you always. Anyway, <laughs> my kids call it dad jokes. That's okay. So, I mean, we were, com we were committed at our wedding altar that we would be missionaries and go where the gospel's never been, and we would bring hope to the hopeless people, a and God made our dream come true. And in 1980, we set foot in South America, and there we were able to uh, go into a, a very backward uh, jungle village. I mean, just dirt and bark walls and no electricity. We had running water. You took a bucket and ran to the river to get it. Uh, there was no flush toilet. There was no Snickers candy bar. There was nothing. No, you know, cell phones. There was no Netflix. We had nothing. But we brought, by God's grace, we brought the grace and hope message of Jesus Christ to those people. And I'm so thankful. And so many times when I was at my weakest, God broke through to me and for me. And worked a miracle for me. God is a miracle working God. How do I know? I've seen it firsthand. I wish, uh, I wish you would stay with me about four hours. And I would begin to tell you some of the jungle stories. Of how God spared our daughter from death. Five foot long Bushmaster snake latched onto her ankle. How God healed her and raised her up. She ended up pastoring Gateway for a while. Uh, I'd love to tell you the stories. Of, of the miracles, of the, the one day when God broke through like a mighty rushing wind in our village. And, and how he broke through. You, it surprised you what he did. But I can, I can tell you this. I know that weakness does not disqualify you. Holy Spirit's got a really good sense of humor. I, I, I was praying one time and I was saying to God, Lord, I feel so weak. You put me out here in the jungle. The language is hard to learn. I'm not that good of a linguist. And, and here I am wrestling with language, wrestling with culture, wrestling with demons, and then wrestling with me. And at times, wrestling with God. And I, I just was whining and complaining, you know. You want some cheese with that wine? And, and I was complaining, God, I'm so weak. Why did you send me? You should have sent Pastor Glenn. He's so anointed and strong and handsome and good. <laughs> or Nick. Why did you send me? And the Holy Spirit said, well, you're more useful to me weak. What if you're more useful to me weak? And I believe in our weakness, God is able to come. It's as though... Weakness becomes a tractor beam that pulls grace into our heart. And the loving mercy of God is like a river cascading from the high place, always seeking the lowest place. And as we're content to be in that valley, even, the river comes and refreshes and strengthens. It's okay to be weak. You know, God uses weak people. That's all he has. God uses messed up churches. It's all he has. God is not limited by human weakness. He actually is drawn to it. There's something about the broken, the poor, 
the devastated, the crushed, the confessor. There's something about that that moves the heart of our king. Weakness is a tractor beam that pulls the grace of God into your soul. Psalm 18, the Passion Translation. Did I mention the Passion Translation? That's one of the thou shalts. Here it is, Psalm 1818. The number, the reference should be easy to remember. Psalm 1818. You can get it on Kindle, Amazon, if you cho- uh, want to do that. But uh, it says, when I was at my weakest, my enemies attacked. And I can tell you, that's been my life story. That when, it's like the enemy wears you down. He loves to get you tired. Like, take an hour of sleep from you. I think we need to fire whoever passed that bill. And we start having 25-hour days. But when we're at our weakest, wore out, stressed, problems seem to multiply, that's when the enemy chooses to launch his full-scale devastating attack. It's called depression. It's called discouragement. It's called hopelessness. You're never going to make it. When I was at my weakest, David said, my enemies attacked, but the Lord held on to me. That's been my life story. His love broke open the way. His love breaks open the way. And then he brings me to a beautiful, broad place. He rescued me because he de- his delight is in me. God's delight is in you. God loves you, cherishes you, doesn't wait until you're perfect to enjoy you. You're the perfect personality match for the Son of God. He told me in the throne room what he really loves about you. Everything. His heart is ravished. He he delights so fully in you that he's going to rescue you. You know, I'll never forget the time. We were accused in the jungle of being CIA agents. The, The government of the nation we were in couldn't believe that an educated American would come out and just live in dirt. So they assumed we were having an outpost. We were near Columbia border, and the drug cartel was operating. And and, uh, many of you know the story. After we left, guerrilleros, colombianos, with automatic weapons, came into our village. A a large number of them swept into our village, kidnapped the missionaries that I handpicked to replace us, took them out into the jungle, and later killed them. So my best friends were martyrs. But I'll never forget the day that... Early in our ministry in the jungle, we had to, because they thought we were CIA, they would not let us go in with our aircraft. They grounded our our very small jungle airplane that would transport us in and out of a 1,200-foot airstrip, grass airstrip. They confiscated it, would not let us. So we had to go by boat, and we had to go by one big banana boat that spent a day or two to get us to Yavisa, and from Yavisa, we had to load all of our supplies for three months, my beautiful wife, Did I tell you how beautiful she is? And our five-month-old son, yes, we took our family into the jungle, our five-year-old daughter and seven-year-old daughter. And I'll give you a hint where the story's going. None of them could swim. We we got into the canoe, and I noticed that the weather was turning bad upriver, and uh, the sky was quite dark. And and as we pulled out, but we had a three-day trip. We had to get moving, so we pulled out with our native guide, and we pushed this very narrow, loaded down canoe out into the rapids, out into the current, and all at once, it was so rapid and swift, you wouldn't believe it, a tsunami wave, a flood, a flash flood came rolling down the Chukanaki River, and it picked up our canoe, tipped us all into the, into the water, and uh, all of our stuff, of course, sank to the bottom, and, and uh, we were grasping for our lives and huge trees massive trees were in this flood going down river so here we are you know it's like a really fast amusement ride minus any amusement and we were going down this river jungle river and 
I'm, I look over. I'll never forget it. It's still in my mind. I look over. Here's my, my wife holding our five-month-old son to keep him from drowning. But she's going down, you know, going down like this, bobbing up and down. I'm thinking, I've got to do something quick. I, I swam over to Joy, our, our youngest daughter. She was five. And, and I got her and carried her, swam over to the overturned canoe, put her on the bottom of the canoe, and hopefully she wouldn't slide off. I ran. I swam over and got Charity, our older daughter, and put her on the canoe and then by that time uh, my wife had started to dog paddle towards the canoe I mean we're all racing down I don't know how many 20 miles an hour I mean it was crazy the rapids were just taking us right I thought we were going to end up in the ocean that's where rivers go you know and then we just cried out to God do you remember that honey we cried out to God help us I mean I said help in every language known to man ayúdame señor por favor Help, Jesus, Chinese, Spanish, Yugoslavian. I mean, I was just crying for help. And, and I, they had to be angels. Beautiful, dark-skinned men in little tiny, like toy piraguas, canoes. And, and they, one by one, they would come and rescue first Candace and David and then Joy and then Charity and then here I am, alone and all the time each one got rescued but at a different spot in the river are you with me i mean we're, we're flying down this river and, and there goes candace with a strange guy i've never seen in a canoe you know and, and they're going to go over to the flooding river bank and then there goes joy and we're still going down the river and then there goes charity at a different spot and i'm probably miles now down the river from them alone hugging a canoe. And finally, somebody came and got me. There's nobody living in that part of the jungle. It was uninhabited. This was abandoned jungle, rainforest. I'm so grateful for angels. Angels have ministered to me so many times. I actually had an angel in Atlanta come into my room. Is it okay I tell stories like this, Pastor? Any believers here? Heaven is for real, you know? Okay, I, I, I just come back from Korea. I was so tired. We were so exhausted. We ministered. I mean, they really worked us there. And, and I was so exhausted. I had these meetings in Atlanta, and I'm upstairs in this, this wonderful home there that they put us in, and, and, I, and I'm just so exhausted. I didn't even think I could move. I was so tired. And this massive angel came into the room and hugged me. Oh, and I'll never forget looking up to him. He, like, head on the ceiling. I said, you are really big. And from that moment on, I had energy and strength I knew not of. And I was able to minister. And it reminded me of when angels came to Jesus. I mean, I'm nowhere in that category. Don't even put me there. But I, I, that, that I would have that visitation. But angels rescued us. I feel like there's people here in this room that need rescuing. You need restoration. You, you're in a situation this morning. You drug yourself here. But you need a rescue from God. Some of you financially. Matter of fact, I think that's what it is. I think some of you need a financial rescue. I think this church needs a financial miracle. As I pray for you and I pray about this building program, uh, you need a miracle. And I want to sow into that. My wife and I determined that we we're going to sow into that. So here's what we're going to do. If it's okay, I mention it. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to sow into our ministry in just a little bit. Give a huge check because we're going to give it all back into the building fund. Everything you give to us in these meetings, I'm going to put right back. My wife and I have already talked it over. We want to sow it right into the building project. Yeah. Glory. And all I ask is that you invite me to the dedication and... Uh, because I like the, the finger food that they serve at the church things, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paul Wilbur. Yeah. Yeah, bring Paul and we'll just have a blast. But we're going to have a fantastic sanctuary. It's going to seat uh, a thousand people, which is already full. You guys know you got four weekend services here? Four in English. Then you got Spanish service. You got Messianic meeting. You got... Portuguese, 
What did I say? Yugoslavian? You got, you're probably going to have Chinese before it's over. You may end up having a Korean. I mean, what a beautiful way to do church, guys. You're so, like, world-centered. You're not just ingrown like a toenail. You're thinking about others. You're an other-centered people. And that's why we're going to sow our, uh, our offering that you give to us. We, we, want, we want to be a part. I'm going to ask you as well. Make a big check out and uh, make it out to the church. And it's not going to come to us. It's going to go into this building program. Father, I pray that hope would fill the hearts of each one. And the person in the room that says, well, why are you always talking about that? Don't you know I have a need? Don't you know I have? Yeah, I know it. I've pastored long enough. I know that kind of stuff. I read minds. I'm a pastor. But, Lord, I pray that that one that is so concerned that we would be willing to sow to see a miracle break loose. We'd be willing to give to see this building project completed. And I prophesy over this house that you're going to impact Greenwich, Connecticut in a way you have not even a clue. You're going to touch the community of Greenwich. And I know some of you don't live in this, uh, in this town, but, but uh, you've got a heart for this town, obviously. And I pray, God, that you will put such favor, you'll just kind of grease the skids. You'll s just oil this uh, paperwork going through City Hall. And, and you'll just put such favor that uh, civic leaders and business people will choose to come and celebrate as we put this sanctuary up in the coming months. Can't wait to see this foundation in June. Can't wait to see room for our kids and grandkids if you're like me and lord we just pray you'll expand the walls blow it out god blow it out work miracles make a way let your love make a way for the people of god would you stand i just want to pray some more things over